And uh, many distinguished uh, scientists and uh, colleagues and friends joined up here, gathered here on this occasion. It is indeed a great honor to speak in this series of uh, history of ideas. In fact, uh, it's not just an honor, it's also a challenge, especially when one considers the very distinguished uh, sequence of speakers and uh, speaking on such subtle subjects as listed by Professor Kumar earlier. Today, I will try to touch upon some of the ideas in cosmology, physical cosmology. And uh, I have titled the talk, uh, as physical cosmology, a modern perspective. Cosmology is the subject which tries to look at the universe in very broad terms. The dynamics, the happenings there, questions that will be looked at are how are the galaxies formed, how are the stars formed, how are the elements synthesized, how did things as we see in a broad general outlook on the external world. And that's the topic of uh, discussion today. And <clears throat> I will try to give a modern perspective on it, but I will start, uh, one has to start somewhere. And I will start with, uh, in the medieval times. Can you give me the next slide? This uh, remote is not working very well. You see, they had a, kind of a cosmology during the medieval times in which the sun and the stars, they were uh, kind of uh, in uh, these spheres. There was a separate sphere for the sun, separate sphere for the moon, and separate sphere for the stars, and so on and so forth. And this was the kind of a view they had. And uh, of course, the planets were not in this kind of spheres, but they were moving around here and there. And uh, this was a kind of a view and earth was at the you know, center and heaven and hell. All these things are uh, depicted as said here in uh, Dante in his poem he wrote and this is uh, uh, Michelino's uh, representation of it. The next slide uh, gives some, some details of the motion of the planets and uh, I am moving five centuries or four centuries from that earlier one to this one rapidly moving ahead. The early concepts were there and uh, by the time of the early Renaissance already the motion of the planets had been uh, studied and it showed very uh, strange kind of a motion. The motion was the planet would kind of make circles against the fixed stars in the sky. If you plot the position of the star, it'll, uh, the planet, it will do something like that. And sometimes it will do that and there will be retrograde motion as well. And uh, people try to analyze it using epicycles and so on and so forth. And uh, it was quite confusing uh, with uh, circles upon circles upon circles. It was never fully understood. <clears throat> then came uh, Nicholas Copernicus and there were also Indian astronomers. Uh, Nilakanta Somyaji of uh, Kerala who have been looking at this and they made the hypothesis that if you try to calculate the orbits of the stars, of, uh, of the planets with the earth as the center, you have a very complicated description as done by the others. But if you put the sun at the center, if you have a heliocentric description, the whole thing falls into a very simple picture of nearly circles. In fact, Nilakanta even says it's a somewhat elliptical thing. I mean, uh, anticipating Kepler a little bit. So this was the beginning of modern cosmology, but still not the cosmology that we have today. I think you have to move it. This sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Next, please. So you can see what's happening. Uh, Suppose, let us say, we are on the, uh, on the Earth's orbit. Let us say this is the Mars orbit. 
we are sitting here, at the first instance the Mars is here, we locate it against the star somewhere there, the second instance there and third instance there and so forth, but at some time somewhere here it starts retracing and also the Mars orbit is not in the same plane as the Earth's orbit that gives rise to uh, not just uh, retrograde and uh, prograde motion but also uh, these epicycles that, uh, that are depicted there. So different uh, planets being tilted in different ways gave rise to a complicated set of motions but if you put the Sun in the center and especially with uh, elliptical orbits you could explain the motions very accurately as uh, carefully measured by Tycho Brahe and later on uh, explained by Kepler. But this was still not a um, dynamical description of the events but this was a, just a description of the events, empirical dis description of the events. At the time of uh, um, Copernicus, the heliocentric hypothesis did not catch the attention of the people as strongly as it did during the time of uh, Galileo and uh, some of you might have uh, noticed, uh, attended the play uh, here on Galileo, uh, how dramatic it was that uh, Galileo was uh, questioned by the church and uh, in fact uh, confined to a faraway castle uh, where he was allowed to contemplate on these issues for the rest of his life. The church did not take favorably to this view of uh, heliocentric hypothesis. But uh, Galileo uh, did two things which are very relevant even to modern cosmology. First of all, he turned a telescope towards the heavens and noticed that the moons of Jupiter were going around Jupiter exactly the way the planets are said to have gone around the sun by Copernicus. So, gave observational tests and observational basis for cosmology, not just dogma, not just history of ideas, but actually each moment checking the ideas whether it's right or wrong. That's one thing he gave. He gave another important idea which as I said is very relevant even in modern cosmology that is he performed an experiment by dropping two dissimilar bodies from the top of Tower of Pisa. It could be apocryphal but still he made the statement that the acceleration suffered by a body is independent of its composition, it's independent of uh, its mass. These two ideas were the greatest stimulants to Einstein much later on. We'll come to that as we proceed with the development of cosmology. I'll be moving rapidly over centuries, so <laughs> I mean uh, sometimes I may forget to tell you that we are moving hundreds of years later and so on and so forth, but bear with me. This is actually taken by an amateur astronomer, but this would have been roughly what Galileo would have seen. This is a uh, very inexpensive binocular through which uh, somebody took a picture. This is roughly what uh, Galileo would have seen. Next please. Then came Isaac Newton. I mean he was the first man to give a dynamical theory for the motion of the planets. And uh, let me uh, tell you about another apocryphal story which is of great importance. Newton suppo is supposed to have seen an apple fall from the tree and from this deduced his theory of gravitation. What it means is the apple suffering an acceleration towards the center of the earth is in inverse square proportion to the acceleration suffered by the moon in its motion in the heavens, also due to the gravitation of the earth. Imagine if motion, the moon did not have a lateral motion, it would fall towards the center of the earth as depicted by the laws written down by Newton. If it has a horizontal velocity, this acceleration combined with this horizontal motion will make it 
go round and round the earth all the time falling towards the earth. This was the kind of an argument that uh, Einstein um, thought of when he saw the apple fall and he, I think uh, some scientist asked him, he was somewhere in Cambridge and somebody asked him, um, do you know what kind of a force law would lead to elliptical orbits? He said, this I worked out long ago, it's an inverse square law of force and uh, we have the Newtonian idea. He also tried to think of cosmology, what's happening to the whole universe, whether the whole universe is filled with stars, if gravitation is there, universal. Universal meaning the forces that operate on the earth are the same forces that operate in the heavens. Heaven and earth are one, there is no difference between them. The same physical laws are valid irrespective of where you are. Heaven and earth are one, we don't have to go like the ancients who thought of some mystical action that kept the sun and the moon in their spheres. This unification was a very important one and moreover he tried to make a cosmology. He said, if all the stars are distributed ad infinitum, would they collapse? And then he said, probably if it is truly ad infinitum, they will not collapse because a star here will be equally attracted on both sides by all the bodies on this side and they will cancel out the force applied on the star from the other side. So this was a kind of an argument that uh, Newton had and uh, this had a flaw, this argument, actually two flaws and let me tell you about one of the flaws and this was pointed out uh, in a very dramatic way by Olbers, it's called the Olbers paradox. Let us say stars are distributed everywhere in the sky like we see the night sky. If I look in a particular direction, if I go sufficiently far away, if the stars are di uh, distributed ad infinitum, then my line of sight will come and end on a star. And when that happens, irrespective of the direction, that the whole sky should be as bright as the brightest star, let us say the sun. So we will be immersed in an oven of 6,000 degrees or some such thing and we'll all be, I mean, it will be so ridiculously bright. That is not what we see. So there was a decided flaw in the kind of cosmology that uh, Newton could build. Of course, later on, uh, genes showed that even if you have a uniform distribution of uh, material, they, that will, under self-gravitation, collapse into little lumps and various kinds of crazy things will happen. But that was much later, but quite early people realized that Newtonian cosmology will not work. The next one, please. So I have uh, made it little more explicit. There are uh, two kinds of masses we can think of. F equal to ma, this is uh, one of the Newton's laws, that is uh, the force needed to move a body of mass m with an acceleration a is more if the mass is more and this mass times this acceleration gives you the value of that force. Let us say this mass which appears in this equation as the inertial mass, that is what is he defined as the inertia. There's another place, this force, if you consider a gravitational kind of a situation, is proportional to the mass, and let us say there's the mass of the earth and there's the mass of the apple or whatever you want, and there's the radius of the earth. This mass, which tells you what kind of a force will act on it, that is called the gravitational mass. I've just pulled it on this side and taken this on the other side. So the question is, are these two masses the same? and uh, Newton assumed them to be the same. In fact, he did some experiments to prove that they are the same. And uh, <clears throat> for example, he studied pendulums or pendula for uh, Latin uh, people. And he found that the period of the oscillation of the pendulum was independent of the composition of the bob or the mass of the bob. And uh, he studied the motion of the moon 
in the combined gravitational field of the Earth and the Sun and showed that the absence of the polarization of the Earth-Moon vector proves that Moon satisfies the equivalence principle, which is that all bodies, irrespective of their composition or mass, suffer identical acceleration in a given gravitational field. Next, please. So, from Newtonian times, I am going to jump, see, since one has to move rather rapidly in the history of ideas, I am jumping suddenly to relatively modern times, the birth of new physics, say, around 1890, 1895 onwards. In fact, those 20 years, I mean, so much of new physics came and it will be virtually impossible for uh, us to discuss even the list all the items that came out at the time. But I have listed some of them which are crucial to our topic today, that is cosmology. Now, atomic and nuclear physics came up. We got the concept of the atom which was discussed in great detail earlier in the series and nuclear physics, radioactivity, X-ray discovery, and black body radiation which stimulated the development of uh, quantum mechanics, quantum statistics came, I mean this is not all put in the right order, they are randomly thrown around because if we try to sequence them, we will miss the interconnections that existed. Quantum mechanics came and special relativity came. This is due to the Michelson-Morley experiment which showed that uh, the velocity of light was independent of the motion of the source of light. So, velocity of light was a constant and Matthew's equations very clearly pointed out this as a constant that comes uh, as the ratio of uh, the electrical and uh, magnetic susceptibilities. So, velocity of light was a constant and Einstein tried to derive a mechanics in which C could be kept constant and that led to special theory of relativity. He went further, I mean this special theory of relativity describes uniformly moving reference frames, uniformly moving reference frames, very different from the kind of Galilean uh, frames that uh, Newton dealt with. There was no absolute space space-time became one, all this kind of a great integration occurred and I don't want to go into those details. In only in so far as they touch upon the subject of cosmology, I want to lead you through that. Black body radiation was known, its spectrum was known and was explained by Max, Max Planck and uh, like that, the discovery of nebulae and even a kind of an idea that these nebulae that we are seeing like Magellanic clouds, for example, they are really not some gaseous nebulae, but they are actually a collection of large number of stars. And indeed, there could be uh, worlds like our own uh, Earth around those stars. These kinds of ideas were there floating around. And uh, they were called island universes those days. Uh, now we call them uh, galaxies, external galaxies or whatever. The spectra of stars had been observed, their colors were noted and in fact even red shifts that the spectral lines of some of the distant nebulae were not the same as the spectral line here but they were red shifted. That was the spectrum was all moving away towards the red for uh, distant galaxies. Many of these things were there around the turn of the last century. So with this as a background may I have uh, the next slide where a very important contribution was made by Meghna Saha. One had all this stellar spectra, but they made no sense. And uh, in fact, uh, the composition of the stars derived, I mean they tried to derive in some way, they did not make any sense at all until Saha came. Saha could calculate based on quantum theory 
what is the population of ions of various levels of ionization in a plasma in a high temperature region of a particular pressure and temperature. This was his contribution. Once you use Saha's equations to analyze these, everything became very simple. We could understand the composition of the stars. We could understand and measure with tremendous precision what is the relative abundances of various elements in the stars. I will come to that in a, in a little while, but uh, I want to show another important con contribution and uh, that is due to Chandrasekhar. He applied quantum statistics and special relativity to the internal constitution and internal stability of the stars. He showed that this degeneracy pressure, what is we call as the Pauli principle was the way at that time it was stated. The formal description of quantum statistics was yet to come in greater detail. It was just on the threshold. What he showed was when we apply this kind of a quantum statistics that two electrons cannot occupy the same phase space volume but they have to, that is the limit in the density of the electrons that you have in phase space. There was a limit that was obtained on the mass of the stars. Of course, you had to apply a little bit of special relativity, little bit of general relativity to get that result. That is, all objects, whether they are material or not, if they have some energy, they will generate a gravitational force that has to be put in to fully derive the uh, white dwarf limit. Next please. And of course it was dramatically confirmed all the masses of the white dwarfs were within the Chandrasekhar limit 1.4 times the mass of the sun. But in the process of writing down these equations he formalized the equations of stellar structure not merely he of course very large number of others, uh, Schwarzschild and uh, Jeans and uh, many other Eddington others. So stars became totally accessible. Before then people said we cannot understand how the stars shine like this. They tried to understand how the stars shine by assuming that it is the gravitational energy as the star collapses that is responsible for its radiation or as the star accretes material for the emission. What is the source of this energy? They did not know. Soon after this detailed understanding, it became clear that the central temperatures of the stars were so high that nuclei were fusing together and it is the binding energy of these nuclei that ultimately came out as radiation. So, a very important step in our understanding of the external universe. So, with all this effort, we know what is the composition, this is the composition of the sun, which what I have shown here, abundance of the elements in very rough way, but in tremendous detail it has been measured today. I will come to it in a moment, but hydrogen 75 percent, helium 23 percent and carbon, nitrogen and oxygen about 1.5 percent rest about half a percent. We, today we can understand precisely how this kind of a composition is obtained for the sun and uh, next slide will uh, tell you how these elements are synthesized inside the stars. There is what is called a shell burning, different kinds of nuclei are burnt, burnt means they combine together to form heavier nuclei in this kind of a process and very detailed models of various kinds of stars of different masses and different initial compositions have been developed so that we can fully understand the composition of our galaxy, of external galaxies, of the sun and different stars and so forth. Next please. For example, see depending on which kind of a star it is, it is contributing to different portions of the periodic table. Next please. 
Another important ingredient in the process of nucleosynthesis is a supernova. Here, a Chandrasekhar mass core forms inside a massive star, say 10 solar mass star. And when that collapses into a neutron star, that gravitational binding energy gets radiated out as neutrinos, which deposit a fraction of their energy in the outer regions of the star, which is thrown out. And this is the debris of the explosion that you are seeing. The neutrinos have flown away. We don't see them, but we see a small fraction of the energy that has been transferred to the outer envelope of the star. In such an explosion, the heavier elements beyond silicon, they were synthesized. And we have to add these slow synthesis that occurs in the stars, plus this explosive synthesis to get the correct composition of, of uh, the interstellar medium or the sun or whatever object that we would like to address. Next, please. In fact, uh, this is the abundances of element in the solar system with intimate detail has been fit right up to uranium through a sequence of uh, such calculations. Next, please. This is not just theory. We have direct evidence for proving that our model of uh, stellar nucleosynthesis is correct. This is one piece of evidence I want to show because this is a very dramatic thing. And uh, this is the spectrum of the neutrinos that are being emitted from the sun. When nuclei combine together, when electron becomes a neutron, that electron has got what is called as a lepton number. And to conserve that lepton number, a neutrino should come out. This is the spectrum of those neutrinos. And these have been measured on the Earth, despite the fact that neutrinos are one of the most weakly interacting particles, especially at these low energies. So this has been done and gives us absolute confidence that we understand the internal constitution and internal workings of the stars. Next, please. This is another piece of evidence about the sun again. By looking at the velocity fields on the surface of the sun and doing standard calculations, we can calculate the, the temperature profile of the sun, the molecular weight of the sun as we proceed inwards, right down almost to the core. And these, again, fit exactly our solar models. So through various kinds of means, we have a full understanding of, of, the, of the stars, how the stars shine. We understand the formation of the solar system. Solar system was formed from an interstellar cloud. Many stars were there. They have been doing nucleosynthesis. And the elements synthesized by them were thrown into the interstellar medium through variety of processes, stellar winds, various dredge processes, and supernova explosions, variety of processes through this debris into the interstellar medium. And it was from such a mix that our sun was formed. In fact, it will be a complete lecture to tell you how we know precisely the origin of the solar system. What different kinds of stars contributed, how much, we can tell by today's uh, thing. And in this, the Washington University, where I visit, has made very pioneering contributions. Now, letting, uh, looking at our galaxy now, we are moving away from the stars to some bigger collection of stars. This is the adjoint view of our galaxy. And uh, it's a very thin structure, our galaxy. We are sitting somewhere two-thirds away from the center, and we are looking towards the center, let us say. So it's a very thin galaxy, and sizes are enormous. I mean, the size of the galaxy is about 30, 40 kiloparsecs from end to end. One kiloparsec is three times 10 to the 21 centimeters, a very huge size. I'm using. Uh, astronomical uh, jargon, please pardon me, 
but um, we have to get on with the essence of the ideas. It is not the exact numbers that, import, that are important. Very huge. Next, please. This is how our galaxy would look if you were to go outside, say a megaparsec or 10 megaparsecs away and look at it. This is actually an external galaxy which is similar to our own galaxy. And this was uh, taken, that picture was taken from uh, the Hanley telescope. And there are some objects in the sky, like quasars, which shine as much as a whole galaxy does, continuously. And these were discovered relatively recently, and these are called quasars. To understand these galaxies, their motions, to understand the universe as a whole, Newtonian gravitation cannot do it, as we saw earlier. We need to have a better theory of gravitation to fully understand how, how to accommodate and have a consistent picture of this whole universe. And that was due to, that picture was due to Einstein. And basically, Einstein made use of the fact that equivalence principle was valid. Even though this is not a lecture on the history of uh, ideas in gravitation, I thought one or two sentences to help you appreciate Einstein's genius would be worthwhile. Next, please. This is Einstein's Gedanken experiment. First, uh, Einstein's thought let me be in a rocket and let me be going up, no gravitational field whatsoever. If the rocket is in uniform motion, I cannot tell sitting inside the rocket. On the other hand, if the rocket is uniformly accelerating upwards, I will find force on my feet and I will feel myself being pulled up like that. And uh, if I drop two different uh, balls like uh, Galileo was supposed to have done, they will both hit the base at the same time. Because when they are inside, they don't suffer any force, but the bottom is moving up at uh, the whatever speed it is, and it will come and hit it. If it's a uniform speed, it will not hit, because this also has the same uniform speed upwards. You can think of it as in a rocket, you can do the same Gedanken experiment in an elevator which is freely falling. You get the same thing instead of hitting the base, it will go, these two will go and hit the roof at the same time. And the long and short of the story is that acceleration and gravitational field cannot be distinguished because of the equivalence principle. And all bodies, if they have the same orbits, we need not say that this is the orbit, it's a curved orbit. He said they can all be thought of as moving along a geodesic or the shortest possible orbit which will connect the two points. From point one to point two, if the bodies move, it doesn't depend on composition, it doesn't upon anything. So let us curve the space so that in that curved space, it is the shortest path. It's a space time actually. Next slide illustrates some of this in a little uh, nice way. Imagine you are sitting on a rotating platform and you want to measure the distance from here to here by laying some uh, yardsticks. I mean, this is how Gedanken experiment of Einstein took place. He knew by special relativity that uh, near the end it is moving faster. So there is a contraction of uh, length near the end. Here you have to keep more number of uh, um, yardsticks to go from B to C along this line. But if you come closer to the center where the velocity is less, the length of the rods are more because the gravitational contraction of length has not, sorry, uh, special relativistic uh, contraction of length due to smaller velocity is smaller so that the yardsticks are longer. So it is, you will have less number of yardsticks if you go along a curve like that. This is not gravitation. We don't have anti-gravity. What we have is gravity here. Around the sun, same thing happens. But the velocities 
are not increasing but decreasing as a function of distance because weaker gravity, weaker velocities, so that yardsticks placed that way, number of counts will be less than when placed on exact straight lines. This illustrates the philosophy behind Einstein's equations. Next, please. Now, he made the following assumption. Let us say universe is homogeneous. When you average over large distances where hundreds and thousands of galaxies are contained in a volume and we average it, on the average, universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So, under those conditions, his equations become very simple and he could write down for the scale size of the universe. That is, the, some scale, some unit which measures the distance between say two galaxies in terms of which we measure all of them and how does that scale evolve as a function of time. And his solutions showed that three possible kinds of universes may exist. One is an oscillating or closed universe like this and another is an open universe rapidly expanding away this is the size as a function of time another which is somewhat in between, it is a critical universe. If the uh, density was slightly higher, it will close upon itself. If the density was wee bit less, it will expand forever. It is the transition universe. In fact, I can anticipate uh, the rest of the talk and say that uh, we are probably living in this kind of a critical universe. Next please. The evidence for this kind of a expanding universe came from the observation of redshifts. You can see that these absorption lines are progressively moving further away into this towards uh, the red as you go to farther and farther as the intensity of the light received from this becomes less. This is the discovery of Hubble. Next please. And as a function of distance of the galaxy, the recessional velocity increased. Next please. This expansion is a subtle thing and uh, I think I would like to spend a minute explaining what we are seeing. Let us imagine that we are two dimensional beings, some kind of little ants which are crawling on the surface of this balloon and let us say we think we are sitting on this, a lump of sugar or whatever and uh, this is our galaxy, this is a distant galaxy. The universe is expanding, we will find that that distance is increasing. It does not matter on whichever one you are sitting, you will find the other galaxies are moving away faster. There is no center to this expansion. As long as you think of it, you are to live on only on the surface. The light moves on the surface of this balloon or the information travels on the surface of this balloon. So, there is no center to this expansion. It is a universal expansion. Next please. So, if we go into the past, we are sitting somewhere here, if we go into the past about 10 to the 10 years, if we go into the past, the universe is more compressed, density is higher, temperature is also higher and radiation compresses more rapidly, the energy density of radiation increases more rapidly than the energy density of normal matter on, our, on collapse. Normal matter it increases as the third power, as r cubed, but uh, radiation because of compression the energy of each photon increases, so r to the 4. So, if you go sufficiently early, we go to a radiation dominated universe. Next please. The remnant of such a radiation from an early hot phase must be seen in the universe today. And this was indeed seen relatively recently, 30 years ago by Penzias and Wilson, 35 years ago. And it had a perfect Planckian spectrum and it was isotropic across the sky. That is, the amount of radiation received from this direction was same as the amount of radiation received from the another direction. So, this was the uniform, homogeneous universe, isotropic universe conceived by Einstein. Next please. This shows the uniformity, but some slight red shift and blue shift are there because our own galaxy is moving through this sea of photons in this direction from the red to the blue. Next please. 
I want to introduce another important concept at this time. In 1972, Rood and King measured very carefully the velocities of the galaxies in a cluster of galaxies. We know that if a rocket is launched with a velocity greater than 7 miles per second, it will escape the gravitational pull of the earth. If you calculate what should be the total mass of this cluster, in order that the galaxies do not fly apart, for the particular velocities that have been seen, it was much more than the visible mass in the cluster by almost a factor of 10. So this was there, in fact, this was first noted by Zwicky some 60 years ago. But these people's detailed measurement confirmed it and at that time, I having seen this uh, paper and heard them uh, talk, I was very impressed by this uh, virial discrepancy. How could this be explained? There was a general idea that there could be some unseen kind of a matter. But I said, let us make the following hypothesis. It is not unseen matter, but unseeable matter. What do we mean by unseeable matter? To see something, it, you throw light on it and you see the scattered light, or it should emit light by itself. But there are particles within the realm of physics, like neutrinos and other particles, which have no electromagnetic interaction whatsoever. So, in two papers, myself and my student Metalliland, we uh, made the following hypothesis. During the extremely hot phase of the universe, there is a thermodynamic equilibrium established. It is so dense and so hot that even weak interaction come into a thermodynamic equilibrium. Under the conditions of thermodynamic equilibrium, all particles are populated exactly equally, equally in some sense. That is, their numbers can be calculated with great precision and can be given by simple Fermi-Dirac law or a Bose-Einstein law, depending upon whether they are bosons or fermions. And as the universe expands, the temperature drops and the expansion rate could be so high that suddenly there is a freeze out. The weakly interacting particles are no more in thermodynamic equilibrium and they survive conserving their numbers and a large number of neutrinos or other weakly interacting particles of finite mass could be floating around in the universe. And it is their gravitational force, even if it's a very small mass that these particles have, will dominate the gravitational dynamics of the universe. And <clears throat> this idea is essential to understand the formation of the galaxies. Because during the early phase of the universe, the radiation which couples to matter prevents this matter from coalescing unless you have particles which don't interact with radiation it is very difficult to explain the formation of the galaxies. So we could explain the virial discrepancy in terms of such particles. Now we know most probably it is not the neutrinos which are doing the job but some other particles weakly interacting particles with fin finite mass like neutrinos but not neutrinos. So that coupled astrophysics, measurement of these things, etc., particle physics and cosmology, that is, these are cosmological in origin that were responsible for the formation of the galaxies. So this interconnection was established at that time. Next, please. Evidence for that exists in the motions of the star, even in our galaxy. If you calculate the speed with which the stars are moving in our galaxy, next please. For example, going round and round like that, next please. Then, if you just take the visible mass of the stars, you expect the velocity to go up and go down in a Keplerian fashion. But the observations indicate that it is somewhere hovering around 200 to 150 like this not falling in the Keplerian, the, this is the Keplerian shape and this is the way it would fall. That is not what is happening, not as r to the minus half, but it is nearly flat. 
To understand this, we need a halo of dark matter even around our own galaxy. Next, please. Same is true of cluster, all clusters of galaxies. What is shown here is gravitational lensing by a distant cluster. This is a galaxy behind this cluster and the strong gravitational force due to all this dark matter here has sheared these galaxies into this shape. And we can estimate the mass, we can calculate how much dark matter is there. Dark matter is dominant, maybe a factor of 10, factor of 20, more than the visible matter that you see as bright galaxies. Next, please. So the modern idea, there are two kinds of ideas. This is the old idea, Zeldovich, Kausik, Gerstein, Metalland, that is some mass here. But nature of uh, weak interaction is such that the cross-section saturate and uh, beyond some mass they start annihilating. So you have a subtle issue called the cold dark matter coming in here. This was pointed out by Lee and Weinberg about almost now uh, 25 years ago. So either it is light particles or massive particles but weakly interacting particles that are responsible for the dominant force that holds the galaxies together. In talking in terms of densities in the universe on the average, this is the expansion rate of the universe is symbolized by this H and this is the G is the Newton's constant of gravitation. A number like 10 to the minus 29 is needed, grams per centimeter cubed, for universe to be in that critical state. We don't know that it is exactly this as the next slide will show where different measurements are there. Luminous parts are negligible contribution to this. But in principle, clusters of galaxies can give you 0.3 and very large scales, it can go to close to 1. The next one, please. So we think that we are living very close to a flat universe, some universe like this. It is not curving in it is not curving out, more or less very close to this kind of a universe in which a uniform expansion is occurring, we are in a flat universe. Next please, very close to that. Now comes a very subtle issue, sometimes a very rough measurement can tell you something very important, more precise than the measurement itself. Maybe I'll take a minute to tell you a story. Here is a woman living in this hut, she sells oranges and somebody asks her why there are no oranges in this tree, but you still every day sell oranges. And she said, my heavenly benefactor rolls oranges on the roof of my house and it falls into this, in the morning I pick it up and go and sell it. This basket is very big, he could have rolled it here or here, but we know that he had to really roll it on the edge. If he rolled it somewhere here, it would fall like that. If he rolled it on the other side, it would fall somewhere else. He had to be very precise to roll like this. So logarithm of the omega parameter or the density parameter is shown here. We say that we are somewhere here very close to zero, but the very fact that it's very close to zero in the past, it must have started exactly at zero that is exactly at omega equal to 1, that during the evolution of the universe we stay here. If it had been v bit less, it would have been expanded away and if it v bit more, it would have contracted away and we are very close to here. This gives rise to a very special paradox. This is a very subtle point and I want you to focus to understand this. I said that the microwave background was isotropic. The amount of radiation I received from here and here are the same. But this region of space was never in causal contact with this region of space. Just now the radiations are coming towards me. Even if information were to propagate with the speed of light, this region had no chance to speak to this re region and say, be at such and such a temperature. There was just no way. I mean, it is depict, depicted in a standard way like this, radiation received from one direction, this is our past light cone, and 
registered from, from here and here they had not talked to each other in the standard Einsteinian cosmology. How do we understand this? How do we understand the fact that universes started out with almost exactly omega equal to 1, so that we are somewhere close to omega equal to 1. This also we don't understand. Next please. And to understand, answer these questions, there are many such questions which are really conundrums within the framework of Einstein cosmology, we have to refer to modern particle physics. In modern particle physics, we have been able to integrate the electromagnetic forces with the weak forces into a what is called as an electroweak force. In fact, we have been able to integrate the nuclear forces, the strong forces also into it, into a grand unified theory. And we have ideas of running coupling constants, supersymmetry, it will take us far away, but modern particle physics allows us to understand fundamental behavior of the nature of interactions of particles and fields, and in fact, there are quantum fluctuations in space going on which tells you about the nature of the fields that are present. The next please. So we have to evoke the following kind of an idea. This was due to Guth. He said, universe in the past, very close to the singularity, was caught in a false vacuum. The energy depends upon some ideas called the Higgs field, which are needed for the electroweak unification. There are two Higgs fields. And as a function of if the field is strong, very strong, somewhere there, the energy is lower than when the field is zero. This is the interesting aspect of it. When it is zero in the past, the, this is a higher than this and the universe can tunnel through this and come to here at different places. It can come to this lower energy thing, just like the tunneling, quantum mechanic tunneling. During that tunneling process, the expansion of the universe is an exponential expansion. That is, the size of the universe grew from a small region very rapidly by factors of the order of 10 to the 20 to 10 to the 30 or even more. This small region was in causal contact. And when the universe tunneled, suddenly the scale size of the universe increased very, very rapidly. This was the idea due to Guth. Of course, this idea did not work very well. It solved the problem of flatness because if you suddenly expand something, take a rubber sheet and expand it, it will become very flat. So we are living in a flat universe was explained. The isotropy was explained. What was the difficulty with this is that when this tunneling occurs, it can tunnel differently in different places. And we, what we have is like a uh, boiling water, bubbles full of it. We will have a bubbly, inhomogeneous universe from this good idea. Next, please. This was improved upon by an idea called new inflation by Linde and uh, another person, I forget his name. And there, slightly different kind of particle theory tuning, fine-tuning the parameters. And here, the universe rolls down to this. When it rolls down, the kind of phase transition that occurs is different, and you don't have this bubble formation. The next, please. So this is shown in these equations, the property of vacuum. Maybe due to the lateness of the hour, I will not cover it. But one issue that I want to show you is that uh, the energy density of vacuum as it enters the Einstein's equation is a constant. Einstein's equation, you have to put uh, both the energy density and the pressure. When you do all this thing, you, get, you do get exponential expansions and you do get this constant. And uh, this has far, far reaching consequences. So the radius of uh, the observable universe is doing this. According to the old Einsteinian idea, it was doing this. But in this inflation theory, the radius of the observable universe did this. 
here is the period of inflation. But the horizon distance in the inflation model is like this. So, this is the distance up to which we can see and this is the distance up to which uh, the causal contact can exist. So, in an inflationary model, this causal contact can exist even in early universe. This region was in causal contact in an inflationary universe. So, a small region of the universe expanded into our present universe. That is why there is a uniformity. The rapid expansion has given you flatness. Next please. Like I mean this is illustrated here. When you stretch it by a big factor, this I have stretched by a small factor of 10 or so here from here to here, you can see already this is flat compared to you know, this sphere, little flatter than this and so forth. So, if you expand it, this will become exactly like cylinder and all these things will be parallel lines, not curved like the, in this fashion. Next please. This inflationary theory also explained apart from this flatness, a small level of fluctuations were introduced into the universe at the just the right level in a scale free fashion to understand the slight inhumanities in the universe that we see. Next please. And this is not the end of the story. In the last 10 years, a very exciting development has occurred. This is a supernova in this galaxy. Notice that this supernova is as bright as this, this whole galaxy. Because of this extreme brightness, one is able to see them up to tremendous distances and they act as standard candles to map the universe. Next please. So another example of a nearby supernova. These are the kind of supernovae that have been systematically studied and the magnitude redshift diagram tells us that we are going through a process of a mild acceleration. That is as though we are entering a second inflationary phase. Not a violent one like in the beginning, but a mild one. Next please. So, in a normal cosmology you expect lines to fall like this, but this all these supernovae are lying higher telling that we are in an accelerating universe. Next please. This shown in another kind of unity. Uh, uh, another kind of uh, units that is the density units. Our universe is following this. If we had lived in a standard Einsteinian universe or even a Guth universe or an inflationary universe, this should have been the situation. But this is the second inflation. That is, this rate of expansion, this is an accelerated rate of expansion here. So, this is what we are. We are in a mild state of expansion. Next please. Evidence for this in the microwave fluctuations it is also seen in the angular power spectrum. Next please. So, to summarize our universe began with a big bang of high temperature and concentration and density. There was a period of rapid expansion in which a very tiny region expanded to encompass more than the observable universe today by a factor of 100 or so. There was a radiation dominated expansion and in that phase hydrogen and helium that we see by and large were synthesized. Then we as the universe expanded the radiation cooled off and we had a matter dominated domain in which galaxies formed and stars formed inside them and all these elements were synthesized. And we are at the moment living in a universe which is nearly flat but very mildly accelerating. This is the kind of a message that I want you to take home even though I have not dealt with each of these matters at depth, but this is uh, just a beginning and to stimulate your interest. Next please. In our institute we are trying to do two experiments to study the nature of quantum vacuum. This is uh, to by measuring the Casimir force. This is uh, my colleague Raji and Suresh uh, and uh, one more colleague Unnikrishnan. We are uh, trying to set up this experiment in uh, IAA. The next one please. Another aspect of uh, the vacuum is the interaction of that vacuum with an atom 
and that's called the Casimir Polder force in the presence of a, a cavity and that is being set up by again the very same people uh, we are all working together to study the vacuum in greater detail so that we'll have a greater understanding of uh, vacuum which may help us to understand the cosmology next please of course from Hanley we can do observation of the skies and do the kind of uh, studies that I was describing next please we also have uh, near Pune giant meter radio telescope set up by the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research so India can provide tremendous opportunities for research into cosmology into fundamental physics and uh, next slide please I think uh, contemplation of uh, these ideas and to fine-tuning and uh, detailing these ideas is our task today. Thank you.